to Dr. and the Diva. It's Treasure Hunt Tuesday, mm -hmm. and this is the time we would normally bring out Dr. Lori to tell people if their prized possessions were actually priceless artifacts. That's right, but today Dr. Lori isn't here because she's on a special assignment for us in a fabulous little town called Sitka, Alaska. Take a look. Hi, Kimberly and Dr. Steve. It's Dr. Lori. I'm at the Sitka National Historical Park in Sitka, Alaska. Sitka is established in the early 1800s as a result of a battle between the Tlingit Native Americans and the Russians who had a settlement here. I've got my binoculars ready. We're going to show you some totem poles and talk about one of the most beautiful places in North America. It's right on the Pacific, Southeast Alaska and I'm here to show you around. Come on, let's see. So we're moving relatively far into Sitka National Historical Park, and the park was established to support these antique totem poles. Some of these are quite old. They all relate to the Tlingit culture, the Native American Tlingit tribe. The totem poles tell a story, or they're a landmark, or they can be built and erected to shame someone or to honor someone. So the one that I chose has a lot of animal symbolism. You're also going to see, of course, the upside down figures. The figures that are upside down probably had some kind of failure or some kind of problem. Sometimes you'll see faces. Faces usually relate to a spirit of a person that they might be honoring or shaming, for example. Red, just like you'd be embarrassed and your face would get red. Red is usually utilized, in fact, on the face of someone who they're trying to shame or embarrass. And at the top of this particular totem pole, which tells the story of a failure of a person because they did not, in fact, identify with the gods, you can see, again, the symbolism at the top, good luck. The frog in Clinket culture is always indicative of good luck. But the Clinket are known for the raven, and the raven is the keeper of secrets. The raven is actually a trickster in the mythology of Native American culture and art. I don't know if you can hear it, but the ravens and the eagles are talking to each other. That's ravens. The eagles have a high pitch sound. Ravens have the largest brain of any bird, and they really are smart. They know how to actually use sticks for tools. They're very, very intelligent animals. And I wanted to show you a newer totem pole because totem pole art is an art form of today. They're still making contemporary totem poles. You can tell the new from the old, or you can tell how bright and vivid the colors are. This pole has a character on it, a figure on it, which relates to something called a potlatch. It's like a big party. He's um, wearing a hat, and that hat is one that the Native Americans, the Tlingit tribe, will actually wear um, of spruce root. So it's woven of spruce root, and then, in fact, it is usually painted, and painted usually with an image of one of the great animal symbols, like a raven. And this is a 150-year-old or so spruce tree. This is a Sitka spruce, and the roots of this tree are going to be used to weave baskets by the Clinket people. I was talking about those hats on the potlash figures of the totem poles. Well, those hats are actually made of spruce root. You know, I didn't realize that we really need to be advocates for the rangers. Basically, you're doing all kinds of work. You're protecting not only the people who are in the park, many of you are firemen and EMTs and paramedics. And, you know, if we had a wildlife experience like a bear shows up, you would be able to actually protect us. So I'm here at the river with thousands and thousands of salmon. And of course, you know Alaska is very well known for the salmon, the canning industry. What's fascinating about them is that they actually come back to spawn to lay their eggs in the exact same spot where they were laid as an egg. If they can't find that exact spot within centimeters, they actually will not lay their eggs and they will die. But the salmon here are really struggling. They're suffocating in the river because there hasn't been enough rain, so there's not enough oxygen in the river. But you can also see the way in which they connect to, of course, all facets of the Native American lifestyle. Not only do you see them on the totem poles, or you see them in form, line, art, and also in, of course, the music and the Native culture, but the salmon, of course, are the lifeblood of this particular area of Southeast Alaska here in Sitka. In the middle of Sitka, Alaska, you really can't miss this. This is St. Michael's Cathedral, built in 1848. It's very typical of Russian Orthodox cathedrals or churches. You can see why they called this particular place Russian America. 
So you can see the bells just like you would see it on any other church. You're going to see the bell tower. You also see a watchtower, which you usually see in New England churches a lot of times because they were looking out of that particular watchtower for the sailors who were, or the fishermen who are going to come home. And you also see the Russian Orthodox cross at the top of the spire there. And you also see the onion domes. Onion domes are those curved domes that are usually in places which are cold because basically it's an easier way for the snow and the ice to slip off a particular form. Like a candle snuffer roof, which is an angle like this, well, the onion dome does the same thing. And that's what we see here in Sitka at St. Michael's Russian Orthodox Church. It's the oldest Russian Orthodox Church in the New World. That's so yeah. fascinating. It's wonderful to discover interesting places like Sitka, and Dr. Lori is a great tour guide. Yeah, she really is. That's yeah. right. When we come back, Dr. Lori is going to show us what makes Sitka really special. It actually has a very strong Russian heritage because of a thriving fur trade. Even though we bought the state of Alaska for two cents an acre from the Russians, they didn't know all the oil was under there. A lot of that heritage remains. In fact, it's one of the best places to find a valuable Russian treasure. We'll find out what it is next. Welcome back. Before the break, Dr. Lori took us on a fascinating tour of Sitka, Alaska. Well, now she's showing us how to track down a true Russian treasure. They're called Matryoshka dolls, or Russian nesting dolls. And believe it or not, this tiny town in Alaska is one of the best places in the world to find them. Hi, I'm Dr. Lori. I'm here at the Russian America store in Sitka, Alaska. It's a fascinating place for every type of souvenir shopping object that you might want. So what I want to talk with you about today is one of the most popular collecting types and those are matryoshka dolls, known as little mother dolls, nesting dolls, dolls within dolls within dolls. These particular dolls were first started out as children's toys. Instead of paints and oil paints, they would use food coloring. So if children are going to put them in their mouths, there would be no problem with children using them. They were learning objects, objects that would teach children actually how to count. They also taught dexterity hand-eye coordination, for example. I'm going to show you some of the tenants, some of the ways to actually identify a very good nesting doll, and to show you those dolls that might be within a budget for you. You might say, well, I only want to spend $25 on a nesting doll. What's the best one for me to get on my souvenir shopping spree? So let's get started. So when I go shopping, there are a couple of things that I always do. I wear a cross-body purse, so you don't hit anything and scratch anything or break anything on the way with a big handbag or a big purse. I bring my reading glasses. I don't get embarrassed to put them on. Sometimes I even bring my 10-time magnification loop or magnifying glass. You want to be able to see the details. And I want you to make sure that you have cash and a credit card. Don't start souvenir shopping in a place like Sitka, Alaska with, oh, I've only got five minutes, because in five minutes, you're probably not going to make a good decision. So I like variety, and you'll notice there's a lot of variety here. Now there's variety in price as well. Let's talk about how you identify a good Russian nesting doll. People will think, well, as long as there are a lot of dolls within the large nesting dolls, the greater number, the better. Well, that's only partly true. It's true that you would like a nesting doll that has a lot of dolls within it, right? But you also want to make sure that what you have is, in fact, a high-quality artistry on the doll. We typically have Russian folk tales are what they are showing on many of these dolls. And here you can see the frog princess, um, the giant turnip story, which is also on display here. The story is usually portrayed in the body of the doll. And then literally when the doll is open, you can follow the narrative or follow the story. Then there are different types of nesting dolls. So nesting dolls that relate to someone's favorite pet or nesting dolls that relate in fact to the religion or the liturgy. There are a couple of things you need to know about nesting dolls. First of all, you don't twist a nesting doll to open it. You open a nesting doll like you were going to break it or open a lock. If you look at this nesting doll, right, that we have here, 
I always say if you close your eyes and you let your hands actually do some of the work, your hands will identify texture. Texture is really the key to understanding whether or not you have a hand-painted nesting doll or whether or not you have a decal or a sticker, a print that has been stuck onto the nesting doll that then has been painted only around the outside. You can actually see the difference in the decal. The decal is a little bit farther on top of the wood and then of course this brown hand painting is a little bit closer or lower to the wood. So you're starting to see where it's sort of a textural element that will show you why this particular piece is $21.95 versus this piece which is $350. This particular piece is all hand painted. There is a tremendous difference in artistry and quality for this one versus this one. You can tell a lot from the back. The back will tell you a lot of information that the front will not reveal. You can see all of the detailing here from the back. There's no detail at all on the back of the very inexpensive one. The attention to the eyes, all of that is important for the artistry and how it identifies the quality of the nesting dolls. Another way that you can tell is the signature. That doesn't mean that everybody who signs something is doing great work, but it does mean in this particular case, all right, well the artist actually also signed the piece. The artisan who does the woodworking is always different from the artist who paint the actual doll. So what you have here, of course, is one artist who is going to carve the doll, the form and such, and then you have other artists who are working. There are artists who will also work specialists. So there's one specialist who might paint the hands, one specialist who might paint the face, and then leaving this body element blank hands it off to another expert. That person's expertise is, of course, the flowers in the center of this particular body of the nesting doll. They have, of course, dolls that will be as inexpensive as a few dollars, five dollars, to about 5,000. And one of the most expensive ones, of course, is this one, all the way up on the top shelf. And you can see it, about 50 of the nesting dolls together, painted all by one family. And they, of course, show everything from the Last Supper, a liturgical or ecclesiastical religious doll set. So I'm looking at these, and you're thinking, oh, there's so many pieces, there's so many pieces. Well, basically, I like I like to see the narrative. I like to see the folk tale, the story. I like those particular pieces. I don't like a nesting doll that looks like this. It's the same and the same and the same, and the only interest in it is that they get smaller and they nest. I look for some guild work or some gold leaf. I start to look for gold in terms of these particular dolls. So I'm a little bit picky, but I'm also someone who says, well, these look nice, but I don't like the contrast between the unpainted areas and the painted areas. I want the whole doll to be painted. I want every bit to be painted. I would like one that relates to a Russian folk tale. I like these. I like a brunette. I'm a brunette. I want the doll to look like me. <laughs> I think this one with the red background and the gilded work, as well as these jewel areas here that are textural and beautiful, and the back, which is so nicely decorated as well, I think this might be my choice. Russian folk tale, dark hair, and some great detail work overall. I think this might be my nesting doll. So Kimberly and Dr. Steve, do you know how to spot a good Russian nesting doll now? I bet you do. We've learned a lot about fantastic pieces and how to tell, of course, good values from not so good values, what's an authentic piece, if it's handmade. Wonderful time, a lot of fun. I hope you got some good information on it, and I hope it encourages you to come to Southeast Alaska and visit Sitka. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Lori. That was really great. Now, Dr. Lori's going to be back in the studio next week with another edition of Treasure Hunt Tuesday. We'll be right back.